kid. Seriously. <laughs> Welcome to the Do Not Congratulate version of the Star Wars in Review podcast. It's the only podcast in town that keeps you up to date with all your John Tesh needs. At the table today, we have Luke Neitzel, who once babysat for Taylor Swift. And over here, Maya Madrid, who was once summarily ignored by Jerry Jones, but did pet, pet President Bush's dog. Every so often, we get together, discuss news in the realm of Star Wars, answer a few of your kids' seriously serious questions, and review an episode from the Clone Wars series. Luke Neitzel! How you doing? Good. I did babysit Taylor Swift, and she was very, very pleasant. And now I have an icebreaker story for every awkward business meeting I have to go to. Awesome. Well, I'm happy that you broke the ice on this episode. What's new and exciting in your life? I'm trying to think if there is anything new and exciting. Oh, I went to I went to Minnesota, and and saw the fire embarrass oh, themselves. My but it was a beautiful day. It was outside. I got to hang out with some of our old friends. The often mentioned on this podcast, Mr. Garth. Hey, yo. Was out there with Kid, me. Seriously. Exactly. But it's okay. He doesn't listen because he doesn't really like Star Wars. Oh. <laughs> you should probably rip on him then. <laughs> he told me that during the, <laughs> the, the stay. <laughs> but <laughs> that was fine. So it was it was a good trip. Uh, got got a lot of nostalgia for my, my childhood home and Got to see the all the stadiums. Got to go to the Gopher Stadium where the, the Loons are playing. Got to see the new Loon Stadium from the highway. See the new Vikes Stadium. See the Twins Stadium. The X, which is like my spiritual homeland out there. So it was a good time. It went way too fast. But what have you been up to? Not much. I read a really good comic book uh, recently. And I kind of stayed away from the all new stuff. Like in, I think it was 2013 or 2014 Marvel. kind of. They didn't reboot. But they started telling new stories from new angles, and the Captain America, uh, the first story by Rick Remender is just amazing. And I haven't quite finished it yet, but basically what it is, is Cap gets pulled into this alternate reality um, from Arnim Zola from the movie. Sure. He's the guy that was in the computer in man. The computer, yeah. And he infects him with this stuff that, like, turns a Zola bot inside him. And he, like rescues this little boy who's actually Zola's son and he spends years and years and years in this like alternate Z reality like raising this kid and the whole time he's having flashbacks to his old childhood now if you watch the movies uh you get the idea that like his his parents that Steve Rogers parents are like war heroes but in the comics it's never that way his mom was uh, was uh, physically abused by Steve Rogers dad and so if you're a fan of the movies and you have you know that classic uh, the classic scene where he's getting the crap kicked out of him in any or in a couple of the movies, and he says, "I can do this all day." Um, it it kind of shows where he gets his sort of tenacity from, and it's from his mom, who would like take a beating from his dad. And it's a real emotional story about being a father, and I just think it's fantastic. And I'm about to finish it, so nice. I'm looking forward to that. Shall we get to the news? Let's do it. All right, your favorite Star Wars movie, Last Jedi, picked up five Empire Awards, and on the red carpet, director Ryan Johnson and some guy named Ram Bergman said that they'd begun work on the next trilogy, but that the work is so slow going and implied that it was in its beginning stages. Luke, pretend that you're Ryan Johnson, which given your delight in racing my arguments and living under the ethos smug with a smile, what would you do for the next trilogy? Give us a taste of a Star Wars galaxy run by Luke Neitzel. Well, with the announcement of the the Game of Thrones guys, I kind of pegged them as the new or the old old Republic style guys. I'll let them go way way back. I wouldn't mind seeing Ryan Johnson handle a trilogy that is Jedi on the run post Revenge of the Sith, pre A New Hope when like Order 66 stuff. Yeah, well okay. like Darth Vader and the Inquisitors hunting down the remaining Jedi that weren't killed in immediately in Order 66. So so chasing after them. I think you could do some really fun things. You would probably you could you could go to some just, you know, brand new edges of the universe as these Jedi are trying to kind of run and panic and regroup and figure out what's happened. Uh, one of the things and and it comes up a lot with me as we do Clone Wars episodes is I really enjoy the kind of smugness and fall of the Jedi. That doesn't surprise me. Nothing about that surprises me. Yeah, yeah. So I I kind of like the idea of, of seeing how that really plays out. Plus, I think you could have some real tense horror movie type things. Any excuse to put Darth Vader back in there is a good thing. So I, I would love to see it go that way. I mean, even Darth Vader doesn't have to be a, a focal point because I think we have to start preparing for what we do with Darth Vader in a post-James Earl Jones world. 
because that's not a voice you can just replace. And I already thought in Rogue One you can see the age in it mm-hmm. and, and how it's changed. So maybe don't make Vader the focal point, but you can still have him appear, and then you can you know go crazy with some Inquisitor designs and and really just just have some fun and not be worried too much about being within the main continuity and and staying true to characters that you know don't need to be there that are more important to the the main trilogy. It's an interesting idea. I mean, you could have him basically as the boogeyman, as the you talk about a horror thing. He could be the 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 bad guy in a horror movie and not say a word and I think oh, that's yeah. how you get past that which actually would make him even which better. is what I had all which if I could change I would change multiple things in uh, the Phantom Menace but I think how scary would Darth Maul have been if he just didn't have a line that whole movie yeah. he just did his kind of pacing tiger thing and that I'd be fine if they went that route yeah. I think for me I would like Ryan Johnson to tackle the reestablishment of the Jedi and I'd like him to put his spin sort of the hints that he's been uh, laying in, you know, what Luke says to Rey and that whole thing about how, like, the, the hubris of the Jedi and sort of reestablishing what the new Jedi Order would be and then like him to do it through the lens of the sort of wild space region of the galaxy. So lots of just weird, weird stuff that we've never seen completely new and just, if he's going to change all this stuff, like, blow it wide open. Um, and that's what I would like. Yeah, I think that, I think that would be good. I don't, maybe this is already in your news, but have you seen some of the new revelations coming out of the novelization? I have not looked. I meant to look at that, and it was not part of tonight, um, but go ahead and share that. Well, you know what? Instead, I'm just going to give you some homework and say we should talk about it next week, because I, I think it's something that I'll be interested to get your opinion, because there are things that I think just add to what they did in Last Jedi that fit perfectly, but I would rather, since I don't have it written out, I don't want to give it to you kind of sure. half-assed. Because I want to get your real honest opinion of it. Because I really liked it, but we're so varied on that movie that it'll be interesting to see what you think. Well, I've heard good things. I mean, people who I respect have said that the novelization is one of the best novelizations. I don't get into the novelizations of the movies. I haven't read one, I think, since The Empire Strikes Back novelization when I was in high school. Back when the special edition came out. But it's got me wondering. A lot of, a lot of good depth. Mm-hmm. There are even some things that explain things I don't like in The Force Awakens that make those things that I didn't like make more sense. Right. So, yeah. And I think in this new Star Wars world, what's nice is you can go and read the comics. And, you, and we talked about, um, I wrote an article about C-3PO's red arm. Mm-hmm. How that was a huge issue, and it turns out to be my favorite thing about C-3PO now. And where <laughs> did I get that? It was in a one-shot comic book. That was one of the best one-shot comic books that I ever read, and that, that book means a ton to me. So... I, I might pick this up, dude. Yeah. I don't know. Hey, got nothing to lose. Item number two, uh, George Lucas is building a museum. Originally planned for San Francisco, then for Chicago. Ground has been officially broken at Exposition Park in Los Angeles. This billion-dollar narrative museum is going to house art from Star Wars, Norman Rockwell, and other cinematic or narrative art. Luke, I know you're not a big fan of L.A., but what do you think about heading down to the neighborhood where Tommy Trojan does his business and taking in a little narrative art? Oh, I would, I would love to see this. I went to, they had a, a museum traveling show of Star Wars costumes and props that I went and saw a while back, which was really, really fun. I still lived in Minnesota at the time, so over 10 years ago. But it, it was great to see all that stuff live. I am heartbroken because Chicago had this Ooh. wrapped up, and then there was some city council thing about how they didn't want to give him a parking lot. They didn't want to let him buy a parking lot or something because they wanted it zoned differently, and they lost the whole museum because of it. So this is something I could have taken my kids to on any weekend if it had been built in Chicago and now it's going to be out in LA I'm not opposed to going to LA I don't dislike LA for the four or five hours I spent there it's just there's a lot of places to see. So I may have gotten you confused with your brother because I know your brother does not like LA. If one of you doesn't like LA because you we had a long conversation, but oh, it, it's probably him. But actually, he goes there a decent amount. One of his good friends lives there. I think he just doesn't like the galaxy. I think it's more his force. More rivalry. about soccer. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> oh well, and I think there's a the San Francisco versus LA. He's he's from he lives in San Francisco. He's very much a San Francisco person. So I think there's just a natural city rivalry. If we have any there. if we have any viewers or listeners that are from California, I think the pavement song called uh no no, I'm forgetting it. There's there's two states is one of their songs, and then um I can't remember the other one. There's another like, Crooked Rain, Crooked Rain has an excellent song about the rivalry between North Cal North California and Southern California. I'm a SoCal guy. That's where I live between the ages of 8 and 13. Um, so that's where I stand on the issue. But uh, hey, look up some pavement. As far as, you know, I, I thought a lot about this museum idea. And at first I didn't like it. I thought it was sort of a self-congratulatory pat on the back. But some of the art and the idea behind what a narrative 
art museum is seems really cool. It's a lot of just art that sells a story. And a lot of like the I checked out the website and some of the exhibits and stuff like that. And it's it looks cool. And it's not just Star Wars, but obviously Star Wars is gonna be a big part of it. And it, it kind of made me you know, they had a picture on the website of Padme in sort of her like you know, Queen Amidala glory. Sure. And it was like it was, you know, some of the artwork from from the prequels and I was like and there's a lot of stuff you can mine from from the six movies uh, that he did, and, and all all the all the things that he sort of brought through art to to the big screen. So and, I'm looking forward to it. Say what you will about what he did with the movies and what you do or don't like, and his ability as a filmmaker. As far as the self congratulatory thing, this is a guy who's given billions to charity, literally billions to charity. I know a big deal with his sale of his sale of Star Wars and Lucasfilm to Disney was making sure that not a single person would lose their job yep. if they transitioned to Disney. I, I think you can you can begrudge the decisions he made in a film, but I think he's a hard person to doubt the character of as an actual human being. The dude gave three billion dollars to kids. Yeah. No sir. Yeah. It's done. You built pat yourself on the back all you want. Right. Um hey a while back there was a call out from a writer at Uprox to ask anyone if they could explain the plan at the beginning of Return of the Jedi. Like how that all came to be the whole job of the hut plan. So <laughs> uh Chuck Wendig he wrote novels like Aftermath, um which I don't like because it's written in present tense and I can't handle any <laughs> novel written in present tense. But anyways Chuck decided to take his crack at it and wrote a pretty funny response. Our listeners can go online to Wendig's blog and read for his explanation. But what I want to know is if you can give an explanation as to how the plan, how you would write the plan, how it all came together for the plan to free Han. To free Han, yeah. Java's palace. Yeah. What's your rendition of it? I think they thought they were the smartest people they thought they were significantly smarter than everyone and more capable so i think they thought as long as we get everyone in every if we get everyone in the palace once we're all together this will be a cakewalk and we'll just easily take over so i don't think the plan was to actually go on the sail barge or to do any of that i don't think leia anticipated being caught as a bounty hunter i think they basically thought oh well the droids will be capable they'll have the lightsaber in there Leia and Lando will just hang out as bounty hunters, and Chewbacca will just bust out. Luke will come in and, and massacre everyone in one shot. So I don't, I don't, I, I'm not. I wouldn't be half surprised too if Luke thought that Jabba would actually just give in to him based on his physical presence being there and being well, a Jedi, Jedi Knight. Right. Yeah, all that type of thing. I thought. I think. I don't think the plan was what actually happened. I think they thought they were just so much smarter and better than everyone in Jabba's Palace that the plan actually just completely backfired but still managed to work out in the end. So my only issue with that idea is that how does Luke get the lightsaber to R2-D2 if he assumes that it, you know, how does that... Well, I think they thought R2 would just be in the, you know, they're like, oh, we'll give him to him, he'll just be in the palace. So he'll be in the throne room, same as C-3PO was. It probably never occurred to them he'd make him a waiter on a sail barge. And he'd be sitting there. Like, like, I, I'm not saying it's a well thought out plan by any means. It obviously didn't work. What but I, I love don't about think Wendig. it was a, a slow play to all get captured and then kill everyone on a sail barge. I don't think it was a slow play. I think it was a maybe we'll give him these two droids. <laughs> maybe it'll work. Okay, well, Leia, do you want to try? Mm-hmm. You know, like I'm warning you. You know, like he warns him at the beginning. Then Leia comes in, tries to extricate him. Oh, the whole time there, Lando's an insurance policy. Uh, what I love is Wendy's basically like, no one give a crap about this when we were, you know, 10 years old. We were just like, this is the most awesome thing ever. Mm-hmm. Boy, and they sh- whatever the plan was, they sure didn't tell C-3PO. <laughs> well, would you? <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, it's time for our kids' seriously serious questions. We've got one tonight. Now, Joy writes, Luke, period. Okay. On this past weekend show, you mentioned that you got a picture of John Tesh's star on the Walk of Fame. And then in all caps, it's like, why? And it has question marks and exclamation points. And uh... Why wouldn't you? I think it's a better question. It's the funniest one that was on there that I saw. I think we also got one with David Hasselhoff's star nice. as well. So we were just looking Although for... at this point, that's a little bit cliche, right? I mean, like, John Tesh is, is different. This, was, Hasselhoff this is... was 2002. And we saw the Hasselhoff one first. So at the time, we were like, oh, that's the lamest star that we've seen and then we kept going and we saw john tash and we're like money shot right there so we we got our picture with that one yeah we were there for ironic laughs being you know smug early 20s people who thought we were 
better than everyone else. Every other tourist that was down there doing the exact same thing we were. Some things change, some things stay the same. Very hey, true. be sure to email us at kidsseriouslyradio at gmail.com. Send us those questions into the show. You will get on air. I promise. Since we only have one question, I was going to introduce a new segment today, oh, which gosh. is called Luke's Apologies and Retractions from last week. Oh, here we go. So I, I found out... I, we talked about the Han Solo posters, and I had mm-hmm. mentioned how the official Han Solo account had switched to the plagiarized posters. That was not the official Han Solo Twitter page, I later found out. That was someone posing as an official Han Solo Twitter page. So when you go to the actual Han Solo Twitter page, it is the, the new revamped poster. And as I flipped through all their media and things, there is no tweet or mention of the plagiarized posters. So those have been yanked down Luca off of Brazzi everything. Luca Brasi with the fishes. Exactly, exactly. So my apologies to, you know, the th- three of you, Joy and my brother and everyone else who, who listened that, uh, and, and Pat uh, in Kansas City, I, I was I was wrong and I'm sorry. And then I also, I felt bad too because I, I talked about how The Last Jedi had a good score as far as uh, reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. But a, a tweeter, Lara, was quick to point out that that was propaganda by communists educated in the Soviet-sponsored colleges that are trying to corrupt us by getting us through movie reviews. So that is why it has a good score. I was not aware of that. So thank you, Lara, for pointing that out. And, um, you know, everyone everyone, take note. Well, first of all, I want to say I think that's really uh, really mature of you. And second of all, are they – is it the, the – Russian scholars at universities were they the ones who edited last week's show and took out all my remarks about Last Jedi? No, th- that was me, uh, who is m- more than happy to talk as much Last Jedi as you want. But I'm I want to do it in a fashion where it's just not us screaming over the top of each other, so it's actually usable audio. Just, just for the record, I don't, you could disagree with this if you'd like, but the way that I remember it is, I was laying out facts and you wouldn't let me finish. Uh, well, I still have part of it saved, so I'm more than happy to send you the the mishmash for you to try and sort through. Well, before we get to that, let's go ahead and review the Clone War series episode uh, nine of the first season, uh, Cloak of Darkness. Ignore your instincts at your peril. Dave Filoni, our showrunner, is directing this episode, written by Paul Dini from Batman of the Animated Series. We follow Ahsoka and the new Jedi Master, Luminara, as they are attempting to shuttle Newt Gunray back to the Republic for trial. Meanwhile, Dooku has re- dispatched Ventress to intercept the group in order to free Gunray. Luke, take us away. So this is a direct sequel to the last episode, which was the Bombad Jedi train wreck of Jar Jar falling down but they did capture Gunray at the end of it so this luckily has no Jar Jar has no C-3PO it starts out on a Republic cruiser where they have Gunray imprisoned Ahsoka and uh, Master Luminaria Luminara? Luminara Luminara are there to guard him as well as Senate commandos which we saw in the background of Phantom Menace they kind of look like the the red imperial guards that guard the emperor. Oh, deep cut. I do not remember that. I thought they were at the, the new. At the very end of Phantom Menace, when Palpatine congratulates them mm-hmm. for, uh, he's been named chancellor and he congratulates them on winning the Battle of Naboo. As he gets off his ship, they're the guards that are around him. Oh, that's awesome. So we have seen them before. So it was nice to kind of bring them back. They are not clones. They are people. They are led by Commander uh, Arguias. Arguias. Yeah. Arguias. And they are there to help protect Gunray as well. We also have a group of clone commandos who are assisting them. Meanwhile, uh, the Emperor Darth Sidious has finally shown his head in the TV show as he is talking to Dooku. And I think this is the first time in the series that Dooku has not been a hologram. That he's actually been a person on a ship. But they're communicating about how they need to get Gunray back because he's a squealer. And uh, they're going to make him squeal. So they decide to dispatch Ventress, and Ventress gets the warning that basically this is her last chance. Now, one thing that I want to ask about Ventress, her name is Asajj Ventress, but I feel like in the first Clone War episode, or the first Clone War series, the one from Way, that she was called The Ventress. Is that just 
in my mind from like the prophetess of the original A New Hope, or am I misremembering that? I thought she was called the Ventress, but it feels like that changed. I haven't watched it in a really long time, but I recall it as being just Ventress. Okay, maybe I'm wrong with that. I'm but sorry, keep going. Now I have an excuse to go back and rewatch that. Hey-o. So hey, I'm all about that. So so Ventress sneaks her way onto the ship that with some very cool droid uh, ships that basically look like. Uh, screws that dig their way into the Republic ship, open up, and then drop in a bunch of battle droids. N- the super battle droids, which we also saw in Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith. One thing I want to talk about real quick, uh, one thing that you skipped over, there's an awesome scene where Gunray is, like, you know, ready to squeal, and uh, our buddy Ahsoka, like, brings the terror. That's what I have in my Yes. Dog, where she totally scares the living crap. And Luminara's like, dude, what are you doing? And she's like, I'm just messing with them, you know? Like, I'm just trying to get them to talk. But she, you know, she looks kind of scary when she's about ready to chop his head off. Yeah, that was that was great. They were playing good cop, bad cop, and Luminara did not get it, but Ahsoka knew exactly what she was doing, and they basically had Gunray ready to go. Yeah. But then that's when the droid ships attack, and they end up dropping a bunch of the super battle droids. We saw those in Attack of the Clones. They're the ones that have blasters on their wrists as they march, and they're just not saying ridiculous things. Like, they barely talk at all. So we have them coming through, and a battle erupts, and then Ventress also manages to sneak in, not with them. So they don't realize Ventress is there but they do know that uh, the battle droids are coming. One of the problems I have with this battle and the battle throughout um, this episode is that it feels like Capital Starships, the precursors to the Star Destroyers, should have more troops on them. And I, I realize that I can't have it both ways. Like, when there's so many troops and there's so much blaster fire, I complain. And now when there's not enough, I complain. But it seems like there should be more. I'm, I'm stretching, and I think you're right, but they have made comments about how they can't produce clones quick enough. Like, they mentioned that in Rookies that they're running out, so they... They're aging them quickly and with less experience, so hopefully we can just attribute it to that. But you're right, it does seem like they don't. You know, you have the most prized guy you could ever have. You could have sent 12 Jedi to guard him. Well, it's interesting and to a see bunch the, the pri- most prized Jedi, because it seems like everybody on the ship forgot about what happened in Episode 1. Newt Gunray is the guy who, like, creates this embargo of this peaceful planet, um, basically helps kick off the entire Separatist movement, and throughout the entire episode, like, Ahsoka's like, who is this guy? Why is this guy yeah. a big guy? You know, they're, they're, like, making fun of him. And it's like, no, this is a big deal. This is a, a big guy. And as soon as I'm thinking about that or the lack of clone troopers, Ventress just cuts off a clone's head. And then yeah. we realize, like, wow, this is serious. Yeah. And it, it's it's some dark battle. It's a complete tone shift once again from what we had in Bob Bad General. But here's the, the good part Bad about Bad that General. is we used to, at the beginning of the series and the beginning of the season, we'd have tone shifts in the episodes. And that was yeah. our major problem. Now, this it was a giant tone shift. But it was a tone shift within the episode, and I, I think a welcome one. But at least the episodes now are like sticking to tone. Yeah, it was. It's a very consistent episode as far as the messages and the the themes it's putting out. What ends up happening in the droid battle? They end up sending Luminara to go battle Ventress, even though Ahsoka says, "No, you need more than just you to do it." And Luminara kind of brushes her off. So Ahsoka is stuck trying to battle uh, the battle droids with the clones. They end up actually getting kind of... Gunray actually escapes, and they actually push Ahsoka into the cell and lock her in. Ventress kind of helps like, with that. <laughs> exactly. Which, his voice takes a back step back into... You know, we had said it that it gets... And then it gets right back into the racial stereotype. Yeah, it's it's unfortunate what Lucas set up with his voice, and I, I wish they would have pulled away from it like they kind of did in the last episode. But anyway, Luminara and Ventress end up fighting in basically the engine room of this ship, and Luminara is immediately almost blinded in one eye and is completely overmatched and is about to lose to Ventress when Ahsoka is able to get there and, and help out. And she's actually been convinced to leave by General Argus, even though she's kind of giving up on her orders, but she knows she has to go help her friend. So she goes and gets in that battle and it becomes a, a three-way battle. And real quick, there was a short period of time where Ventress actually um, comes into contact with Ahsoka. And in that moment, I thought the the lightsaber battle between them, it was very short, was really weak. It was choppy and weird. Mm. And I just expect more of Filoni. But then when we get to Luminara, and then when we get to, especially when Ahsoka gets in, the lightsaber battle is awesome. It's, yeah, and it's so, amazing. The way... know, it, was, it, was, it didn't really fit with how the first one went, but it was like... The second one was so good that I kind of forgave the first one. And and Ventress moves like a ninja through mm-hmm. everything. Like she was she was built up really big, which was fantastic because she's only been in one other episode really, and she was really weak in that one. That's where Yoda basically manhandled her in the first episode. So to see her 
basically be stronger than two Jedi as she she fights him and smarter yeah. than the two Jedi was great. She had preset bombs as well. And then it also turns out that Argus is not that surprisingly a traitor who is, lets Gunray out and kills some clones in order to get Gunray out. One thing I want to say um, about Ventress before we get too far from that is one of my favorite things, she leaps down an elevator shaft and takes both of her lightsabers and sort of digs them into the side and like slides down from like the oh, lightsabers yeah. like melting the side of the elevator shaft. And it was just like, holy crap, that was just a great idea. But the part that I have about Argaius is like how many, how, like how many times are they going to do the spy thing? Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's just like, it's, and it's starting to get old. Yeah. And you, again, you saw this one coming. From the first moment he talked, the fact that they gave him a name basically mm -hmm. gave away that that he was going to end up betraying them. He also he he gets on, he gets on the ship to escape, and so does Ventress, and so does Gun Ray, and he's bragging about how much money he's going to get, and Ventress immediately murders him, which was a lot like what happened to the droid dealer in Battle of the Droids when Grievous straight up murdered him. So they get away. Gun Ray is not going to be a prisoner of it. This was quite unexpected because i knew it was going to be a sequel to bombad jedi which is the worst thing we've ever seen and this episode to me was amazing yeah, this was it. everything i want in a clone war sh episode ventress was just this terrifying villain that overmatched them and they had to fight for their lives it had fantastic lightsaber battles which yeah. is the one thing that's missing from rookies is there was no light there was no jedi so there was no lightsaber fights within it all the ship designs were really cool. I thought that the way they used the super battle droids was fabulous because they didn't talk and they just kind of motionally marched at you as they, they killed everyone and they seemed really, really overwhelming, which they've never seen in Clone Wars or anything else. So it was good to see them look kind of terrifying as well. They reminded me of Terminators or zombies just motion or, you know, just completely emotionless. Just that, that oppressive wave of death. Just com yeah. coming at you one after the other. The way they... I use the word shot because I'm not sure what the proper term is for animation, but the way they shot this was really claustrophobic. It's really tight shots, so it made you feel like even though it probably was only seven battle droids in frame kind of marching in lines, it looked like it was... All the space was filled with them. They also did just some really fun shots. A couple of the times they did perspective shots. So there's one time where Ventress is assaulting Luminara, and you're seeing it through Ventress's eyes as she comes at a very overmatched Luminara, which made it kind of terrifying to see the fear in Luminara's eyes as Ventress is coming at her. So I think that they did some really innovative stuff here that we haven't seen Everything about this episode hit the right notes for me. It hit the right tone. The fact that you you brought up, I didn't even realize that it was Filoni and the guy from Batman. The Anim exactly. And I thought the music, it was almost like an homage to his time on Batman the Animated Series. If you go back and listen to the music, it sounds like a Batman the Animated Series well, music. And, and now I, I'm basically in the mode, if we're going to have these episodes that are two-part episodes we're hitting a trend where the what you think is the worst possible episode you could have is going to be followed by something really excellent right so it it was great to see this story unfold in a way that was entertaining because man if it would have been more jar jar and c-3po bumbling through getting nuke gunray somewhere it it would have been just too much to do two weeks in a row and, and that's and that's kind of like when we had downfall of the droid followed by duel of the droids or we had uh bomb edge and i now followed by cloak of darkness I had the same feeling each week where I was like, oh man, this is going to be terrible, and then this is worth it. And then last week, this is going to be terrible, and this week, it's worth it. And I just, I, I think you're right. It's interesting how it like kind of flops back and forth like that. And uh... It makes me hope that Filoni is going to run more of the individual episodes. I'm sure he will. Right. But man, when, when he gets involved, it really seems like it, it takes off. And this, this is everything... I have asked for out of the Clone Wars when I've been disappointed, even in episodes like the the first one with Yoda ambush, which we have both ranked very, very highly, and it's an entertaining episode. My problem with it is how terrible the the villains come off. They mm -hmm. just look completely incompetent, and th this showed Ahsoka's growth. This showed the weakness of the Jedi. This sh had them not they didn't really win, but not be killed, able to escape. But it showed why the Separatists are a threat. So it was really, really a, a great thing. 
Yeah, I I also have it ranked pretty high. I have a couple nitpicks. Um, Ahsoka's way too powerful with telekinesis to win the battle against Ventress, or just, you know, basically save Luminar. She, like, pushes her into a tube, which is so much more powerful than normal Jedi are, and it's kind of for a Padawan. It's just not realistic. Wasn't that, though, when she didn't know Ahsoka was there, so maybe it was she was, if she would have focused on Ahsoka, she, Ahsoka wouldn't have been able to do that, but she surprised her as she was about to yeah, I kill just think Luminara? In, I mean, in the whole context, I mean, when you have Rey, who, you know, in The Last Jedi, who's, like, lifting up a bunch of rocks like kind of slowly and with great effort and then you have this padawan who's just like does something amazing i i didn't think it fit with between maul ventress and grievous you think some of the good guys would go the multi-blade route yeah. you know and then the whole luminara luminara who is not a great you know she's not as extremely proficient with the lightsaber as say like obi-wan kenobi the idea that she's just going to tell ahsoka to stay back and go attack somebody who is more powerful than she is just didn't fit for me oh see i love this because again it plays into how badly the jedi are running things how cocky they are how how they think they can handle everything and that's really what leads to a lot of their downfall i think one of the most interesting things about the prequels in hindsight is watching the arc of obi-wan kenobi as he kind of goes through that because he starts out as a kid who kind of doubts things in phantom menace to kind of fully ingrained in the Jedi and the Jedi ethos and thinking everything they do is right, to watching that completely fail on him and then having to run into hiding, spend decades upon decades living as a hermit and being thought of as a crazy person just waiting for his chance to try and redeem himself. And I think showing these failings of the Jedi is something that really interests me and I I really enjoy. I agree with you on a philosophical level. I just think it was really fucking stupid for Luminar to do and seemed unrealistic. Yeah, she does I mean she does seem like a, a pretty pretty much the most incompetent of the the Jedi we have seen, the full fledged Jedi. So how many pews are you gonna give this, buddy? Oh, this gets all the pews. This is this is what are we, five pews. This is my number one. This, this is number one. This jumped ahead of of uh, rookies. rookies, which is also excellent. But again, this had the the lightsaber battles. This had such a great villain in Ventress, who I've been waiting to see this from. So this is definitely my favorite so far. Uh, it's fourth for me. It's it's among the top. It's the bottom of the top echelon of my favorites. So I have four favorites. This ranks number four because of those nitpicks, but also because I watched it twice, and one of the times I fell asleep. <laughs> that's a problem <laughs> yeah so i feel like I, it has to lose points for that let's get to other nerd news and i'm a nerd we have news for the beautiful people there's a lot more of us in our view luke what have you been into buddy what other nude nerd or nerd did i say nude either one i suppose that was awkward yeah well you i know, know what i've been into i don't have any pants on so that <laughs> might explain it but i mentioned it last week i have been watching jessica jones i'm now almost done with jessica jones and i really really like it it's it's not quite as good as the first season which was a little more tightly focused but this is a completely different show than we've seen from these marvel netflix series so mild spoilers but it, it doesn't really tell you too much but anyway, if you don't want to know, skip ahead. But there is no real central villain to this that they're trying to hunt or fight. This is about characters interacting and growing and themes of, of family and, uh, you know, your connection to family and what you owe to your family and, and how you make those ties work through adulthood. And it's really, really interesting to watch. And it's it's something different, which is something I'm always kind of looking for. And that's partially why I love the first season of Jessica Jones. It wasn't just putting on a costume and punching things. So I'm really excited uh, to finish the season. I only have a few more episodes, but it it's it's really good. Know what you're getting yourself into, because if you want The Punisher, if you want Daredevil, this is not it. But if you are looking for a different take from a different perspective, I think the show's been really good. Awesome. Well, this past week, you know that the idea of the Marvel crossover movie Infinity War has been a big deal, right? Yes, and can I just mention the best meme I saw was one of Murder, She Wrote, and Magnum P.I. Oh, that's a crossover. Great. Yeah, it was that pretty good. Great. Uh, well, we're going to do our own little crossover, if it's all right by you. Jed Dawson, sure. uh, contributor, writer, blogger, filmmaker, uh, playwright extraordinaire he's written for the website a ranking of wes anderson movies in honor of the isle of dogs coming out i'm not sure how i feel about this movie and i want to get your thoughts we're going to play a game it's called rated underrated or overrated in reference to where he has them on the list going from eight to one okay so i'm i'm saying whether jed 
overrates or underrates them. Correct. Okay. And then we're going to rank them. Okay. Because it's going to be fun like that. Okay. Because I like Wes Anderson movies. All right. All right. Let's do it. Number... You ready? Yeah. Number eight. The Darjeeling Unlimited. Rated, underrated, or overrated? That's rated. That's rated? That, that one is so forgettable. I've seen it. I can barely tell you about four things that happened other than the kind of staple Wes Anderson things that always happens. There was a suicide attempt, fractured family, trying to work it out, those type of things. They're on a train. <laughs> that that movie was one to to just forget, and that is does seem to be the one that even critics and audiences forget. Not me. I think it's underrated. I actually really, really like that movie. Yeah. All right, number seven. Tension's building. You ready? I'm ready. The Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou. Oh, that excites me that he rated it this low. Because I don't like that one at all. I thought it was insanely boring and insanely more of the same shtick we get, but without any of the charm or an actor who really was able to bring it to life like we see from Gene Hackman, like we see from Ray Fiennes. So that is one that I have never gotten the infatuation of. The funniest line is the For Revenge line, uh, and that happens right away in the movie, and after that it's just a slog. So I'm, I'm excited to see that one rated low. This one was eaten. This is criminally underrated. This is my favorite Wes Anderson film. I think it's phenomenal. Um, I liked Royal Tenenbaums as well, and we'll get to that. But what I said is, uh, once upon a time, to an email in an email to you and Jed, was that Royal Tenenbaums is um, fundamentally about being a bad father, and uh, the Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou is fundamentally about being a fake. And that's something that hit home really with me about what we project to the outside world. And, and that sort of things. And I, no no movie by Wes Anderson hit me as hard as The Life Aquatic. And I love that film. Number six. Dum, dum, dum. Fantastic Mr. Fox. I haven't seen this one, so I guess I don't know. All right. I have it as overrated. Okay. It was I was completely forgettable. It so it should of... have been, what, last? Re- oh, well, we'll get to that, I We'll suppose. get to that, yeah. Number five. Bottle Rocket. Ooh, I'm going to say underrated then, because I really, really like that one, and I think it it's his first, so it's the first one I ever saw, so everything about it was new and fresh when I saw it, and I also think it is more kind of charming and charismatic than a lot of his later movies go, because he just gets way too dry for my taste, and I think this one just has a little bit more energy. It's the best performance from both Wilson uh, both, well, all three Wilsons are in it, but from Luke and Owen, primarily, it's their best performance in a Wes Anderson movie. And who doesn't like seeing James Con kind of halfway care? Yeah, I this is underrated. Bottle Rockets up there for me. I think it's fantastic. Um, I actually watched it. I had never seen it, and you recommended it to me, and I watched it and, and really loved we, it. My brother and I actually, the, the movie got. I never heard of it. It got special recognition at the MTV Movie Awards, and they showed some clips from it. And my brother and I immediately went to, I think, four different video stores before we could find it, so that we could watch it. And then we bought it, you know, maybe a day after that. So yeah, that that's one we kind of grew up on. Number four, he has Moonrise Kingdom. So it's a it's a Wes Anderson list. So I, I guess I'm going to say rated on that one. That's where I I put that. It, it's it's entertaining enough. It falls into a lot of the same traps that he kind of always does. But it 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 has Francis McDormand, so you know that makes everything in it better. There is a little some of the things with the kids. I wish they would have been older and more clothed. Yeah, that was awkward. But um, you know, I, I'd say that's probably about where that that ranks. I would say it's other than Bottle Rocket, it's better than the other ones. I have it as um. As rated, it's yeah. right in the middle, and it's it's all right, it's fine. Uh, number three, Royal Tenenbaums. Well, underrated, underrated by a lot. This is by far my favorite Wes Anderson movie. I think it is. It was original because it it, it was him hitting his peak. I think he was kind of building, you know, in Bottle Rocket and Rushmore, and this is where he really kind of brought it all together and made as close to a perfect movie as I think he can make. I don't think there's an actor who has ever been able to do as much with what Wes Anderson writes than Gene Hackman. He was that role. He dominated that movie. It was an award-worthy performance. You you talk about how Life Aquatic connected with you. Royal Tenenbaums and the father in that connects more personally with me as well. So I'm able to recognize that that might be part of the reason I gravitate to it so much. But I really think that that movie is an exceptional movie, and I have a hard time thinking Wes Anderson will make a better movie than that. Yeah, I've got it underrated because I have it ranked as two. I've already said that Life Aquatic is number one for me. Royal Tenenbaums is number two. So what's number two for Jed? He goes Rushmore. 
This is one I saw really late, and I know it came out to a lot of acclaim and whatnot, and I think it probably suffers to me for me because I saw it deeper into the Wes Anderson shtick. So it felt like more of the same, but it didn't have the energy of Royal Tenenbaums. I, I think that Jason Schwartman's shtick got kind of wearing at the end. And as much as I like Bill Murray, I think too much of subdued Bill Murray is a waste of Bill Murray. And I think that's what Wes Anderson gets out of him all or wants him to be a lot of the time. And it's not how I generally like to see him. So... So this movie isn't one that ranks super high on my... I get why most other people like it more than I do, but it's just not one that's going to get that high on my list. My of it is extremely overrated. I didn't. En- I enjoyed it, but didn't enjoy it as I as much as I usually do Wes, Ander- Wes Anderson films. So he has number one, Grand Budapest Hotel. So I'm going to say overrated, but only because I, I love Royal Tenenbaum so much. This is a weird one for me, because I think if I would have seen this one... Before Royal Tenenbaums, or would have seen it right after Royal Tenenbaums, I would have loved, loved, loved it, because it is great. As much as I heap praise on Gene Hackman, the person who comes second to trying to make the most out of what Wes Anderson does is Ray Fiennes. Like, that is just just hypnotic, what he does in that role. So it's it's absolutely entertaining to watch. I 100% get why people like it. My frustration with it is that it's just so much more of the same as far as the aesthetic, the camera shots, the dialogue, the themes. It's all kind of the same thing. Uh, This week, Screen Junkies put out an honest Mm -hmm. trailer that is all of Wes Anderson's work in one one honest trailer and it is the most for me nail on the head perfect summation of my problem with Wes Anderson movies and Grand Budapest Hotel if you see it on its own you haven't seen a Wes Anderson movie it's genius when you see it in the context of the other seven movies that came before it it's disappointing he won't do something different well I've actually never seen the Grand Budapest Hotel because I've been waiting for it to come out. I think it came out either on Netflix or Amazon for a time, but then I completely missed the boat. I checked last night to try to prepare myself for this conversation. Still haven't seen it. If you buy in 100% to everything Wes Anderson does and you love his movies, I think that's one that'll be at the top for you because mm-hmm. it's it's Wes Anderson doing the things he does at a really high level. For me, it's just I'm tired of that. Yeah. One thing that uh I, I haven't seen Grand Budapest Hotel, but I recommend everybody who's listening to this to go and see uh, the short film, What If the X-Men Were Directed by uh, Wes Anderson. That is good. And we hope that you survive the experience. And that's free on YouTube, so. It just, is. Just YouTube. Go do it. Go do it now. Hey, we've taken a look at Jed's rankings. Now we'll go with mine, and then we will go with the culmination of yours. Here's my rankings. Number one. Life Aquatic, number two, Royal Tenenbaums, number three, Bottle Rocket, number four, Moonrise Kingdom, number five, Darjeeling Unlimited, number six, Rushmore, and number seven, Fantastic Mr. Fox. Luke, what do you think of my rankings as compared to Jed's? Uh, you have the ones that I like a little bit higher. There's still, I mean, I the Life Aquatic thing is something that we're always going to be polar opposites on because take a guess where that's going on right. on my list. It's going way down. But um, I, I, I get where you're coming from on that, and I, I understand that I'm in the minority among a lot of people and not liking that movie, but man, I just, I had a hard time paying attention, and it, it just, it, it bored me. I didn't like anyone in it, and I didn't want anything good to happen to any of them in it. I just wanted it to be over. Um, but the line ab- about, well, except Willem Dafoe. Willem Dafoe is pretty good in that movie. Sebastian was eaten! Or no, I'm sorry. Esteban! Esteban! <laughs> Thanks for choosing me. Um, and that, that in the line of, a, what will be the purpose of this mission? Revenge. Revenge. That's that's fantastic. So uh, it's it's got a couple high points, but other than that, I think your list is is pretty pretty solid. So let me let me take a look here, because i got to think about what each movie is. Number one for me, by a long shot, is The Royal Tenenbaums. That's not even a... Not even something I have to think about. Number two is definitely Bottle Rocket, which might not be a perfect movie, but the combination of when I saw it, the rewatchability of it, I think it's more rewatchable than a lot of the other ones because it's goofier. Um, so I, I I would put Bottle Rocket at it has number a lot of two. Soul too, I think it has a lot of soul in that movie. It's it's sneaky good. It it does. It I think it it does a better job of making the majority of characters likable. Where I think. The problem is, is in a lot of his movies, there's only one or maybe no characters that are likable, which gets me a little detached. And 
you want Dignan to to do well. You want um Luke Wilson to do well. You, you care about more than just one person. Um, and, and I think that's really to its credit. So Bottle Rocket would definitely be number two. Three, I will go with uh, Grand Budapest Hotel, even though I, I already mentioned some of my problems with it. That Ray Fine's performance is just just something to behold. So I, I'll, I'll probably put that in the three spot for me. Four, I think I'm going to go with Moonrise Kingdom, which again is, is basically just a lesser version of some of the other other movies that we've talked about on there. Um, next, I'll probably go... Now we're getting into the uh, don't really kind of care about type area um, where I'm probably going to go Rushmore because I think it has better quips, to be honest. It's probably what's going to put it put it ahead of some of the other ones, followed by Darjeeling Limited, which I barely like better than Life Aquatic just because I think it's shorter, or at least it felt shorter. I didn't particularly enjoy watching either of them. And, you know, ranking my favorite one last gives you a little bit of satisfaction. It does. It does. Well, and I feel like, you know, Darjeeling Limited isn't one that anyone battles me on. Where Life Aquatic ends up being a battle, which makes me dig in because people love that movie. I've never met anyone that love loves the Darjeeling Limited. You, your your review of the Darjeeling Limited is probably the most positive I've ever heard, and I probably know four people that have watched it total anyway. So uh, I'll, I'll put that one then, and then after that is where I would throw Life Aquatic at at number seven, which just does nothing for me. And I didn't see Fantastic Fox, so that one's left off. Luke, we're at the end of this episode. So, um, where can everybody find you at? Well, I am at Luke underscore Neitzel, N-E-I-T-Z-E-L, and I am not getting tired of being yelled at about why Force Awakens is better than Last Jedi, which it's clearly not, but feel free to tweet at me and tell me all your theories about communist judges and reviewers and all the other crazy things that keep you up at night. I'm Maya Madrid, and I can be found at Maya Madrid, and I also didn't talk about any kidney stones in this particular episode, so I hope you enjoyed that. For now, uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks a lot for tuning in. <laughs>